Good morning, my name is Scott Seaton, and I want to welcome everybody here to the forum on uh, race and justice and the Westminster Standards. Uh, let me just even begin with a word of prayer, if we could. Lord Jesus, we thank you for uh, this time here that you have um, planned from literally, we believe, all eternity that you've set this, uh, this morning in motion, uh, bringing the, the folks into this room that uh, have, uh, you've set this upon our hearts uh, to interact with one another, people from different backgrounds and stories all around wanting to see uh, you uh, be preeminent in all things. And so I pray that as we talk about uh, even challenging matters here, that we would have our eyes focused on you, that you would warm our hearts towards what you have for us today. Uh, and uh, we just pray uh, for our interactions, for the speakers, uh, just all to be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to welcome everybody. My name is Scott Seaton, and I uh, am not only a, a pastor here in Potomac Presbyterian, Emmanuel Presbyterian in Arlington, I also serve as the chairman of the uh, Potomac Presbytery's uh, Committee on Mission to North America. And we do several things uh, as a part of the M&A Committee. We help uh, coordinate uh, church planting in Potomac. We uh, work with churches in need of renewal, do a couple other things, resourcing. But one of the things we do is we also have a team that's working on something uh, called our, our Unity uh, Ministries. And the, the idea is to be able to promote uh, racial reconciliation and diversity within our presbytery and as a part of even a national effort that uh, this presbytery was involved with uh, several years ago getting started. And so we want to see that same sort of work done here locally and, and so this effort this morning comes out of uh, sort of that unity uh, subcommittee of our, of our uh, Committee on uh, Mission North America. And the genesis for this morning actually began uh, probably well, when did it ever begin, but at least a couple years ago, I guess, uh, but also particularly over the summer when after months and months and months of all the tension and discussions, uh, division, uh, very difficult conversations centered on race and justice, uh, I and a few others were, at least our perspective was that it seemed like a lot of the discussions uh, be, uh, trended towards rather than like scripture and uh, what does God have for us, we're really being argued in the arena of sociology. And we wanted to be able to say, well, what, is the, what do the scriptures have to say about it? What, what, you know, what could be our response as a church? How should we be thinking biblically um, you know, about, these, about these issues that are before our country? And so uh, Erwin and Mike Park, who chairs the Unity uh, Committee, and I'll uh, come, have him come up in just a second here, uh, and I got together a few months ago to talk about what would be an appropriate response to help uh, our churches and our presbytery navigate these issues. And we talked about some different things and, uh, and out of that conversation came this morning was the idea would be able to let's, let's get together and see what uh, our reformed tradition, how it can help us. So I won't steal any more of, of uh, Mike's thunder in terms of setting up uh, uh, the, uh, the, the speaker for this morning. Uh, but what I do wanna do is, uh, it, it's, we aren't just, the, the point of this morning isn't so much just to listen uh, to Dr. Ince, uh, as, as significant as that will be, but also to be able to interact around the tables. And so we, we have built in a lot of time for discussion around the tables. And so even just to tee that up, uh, what I'd like for everybody to do around the uh, tables, every table should have someone who's helping to facilitate the conversation. Uh, but if, if you could just take a, a minute or two and share uh, your name, uh, the church that you're part of, and then also just one sentence, maybe two, because we do need to be quick, uh, because we'll have plenty of time for interaction later, just of what you, why you're here today, okay? Just try to say that in one sentence, okay? Uh, so everybody take a, maybe five minutes to do that at max, and then we'll be back and Mike will jump up with the interviews, okay? Great. My name is Mike. I serve as one of the pastors uh, in the Grace DC Network, and as Scott Seaton said moments ago, um, I've been a part of the conversation that sort of gave birth to this morning. And I come this morning as a student myself. Uh, I want to continue to engage in this important conversation as we seek a beautiful community. I think uh, Dr. <sighs> Reverend Erwin Ince knows a thing or two about that. So let me just quickly introduce our speaker for this uh, morning. He is known by uh, a lot of things to many people, and so I'm not gonna cover all the credentials, but a couple of important uh, ones that are worth noting. One, he recently became a grandfather. Yes, it did. And as we all know, 
Yes. And That's all know, that matters. You can skip is everything that it? else. Okay, you know what? <laughs> well, as we all know, grandchildren are God's gift for not killing our kids, right? And so <laughs> Irwin's made it. Praise God for that. And for the rest of us who are still hanging in there, raising our kids, uh, this is what we have to look forward to. Not only that, Irwin is uh, very familiar with kettlebells. And uh, I think his physique speaks for itself. And uh, if you're interested in uh, bodybuilding, CrossFit of any sort, uh, talk to this man and uh, he will have you covered. No, in, in all seriousness, Irwin has done a lot of thinking around this topic. He's written a book, he teaches at RTS here in Washington, D.C., and uh, you sense it when you interact with him. He is concerned for the church because he loves the church. And uh, his insight, experience, and all the thinking that he's done on this topic has helped me and Grace DC in particular, but also here at Potomac Presbytery in many ways. And I'm excited for him to come and share with us this morning. So without further ado, let's welcome Reverend Dr. Irwin Itz. Thanks, thanks, man. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you all. I know most of you in the room and look forward to getting to know uh, at least meet those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting before. And as Mike said, this is an issue that really is close to my heart. I think that as we have seen over the past several years in particular with escalation uh, since 2020 in uh, the issue of protests against racial injustice um, and the, the, I think the relatively poor job that we have done uh, in the church in dealing with these issues well and talking through these issues well, uh, it really has been my heart to just say, uh, as, as people get animated about uh, um, things like critical race theory uh, and other um, perspectives that they, um, that they want to critique as not coming from a Christian perspective or a biblical uh, worldview, uh, the, the point that I want to make and that I've been trying to make over the last several years is that uh, as followers of Jesus, particularly within the Reformed and Presbyterian tradition, we actually have all that we need to have a robust engagement of this topic, uh, that our, the scriptures and our standards are enough. Now, as, and I'm not saying that we should completely dismiss uh, non-biblical uh, perspectives that come out of uh, a worldview that doesn't arise out of the Christian tradition, um, because all truth is God's truth, wherever we find it. Uh, but I'm saying in terms of how we engage within the body of Christ, particularly as those who are in the Presbyterian and Reformed tradition, if we lean heavily uh, into the scriptures and our standards, it will go a long way. And so uh, what I want to do, and I've already kind of busted the time because um, I kind of go off script. Uh, I am a preacher after all. Uh, is have a twofold engagement in this conversation. As Scott has already told you, this is an interactive day. So I will speak and then we'll have some discussion questions around the table, but there are two parts. The first part is um, how do we have these conversations amongst one another as sisters and brothers in Christ? What what does it look like for us to engage in these very challenging topics and conversations with other followers of Jesus Christ, maybe even within the same congregation? Right. And then secondly, what does it look like for us to engage these topics and conversations on race and justice and other polarizing things with our neighbors who are not yet a part of the body of Christ? Uh, what is our duty in, in, in engaging with uh, unbelieving neighbors in a way that honors and glorifies God? And so my singular objective for us today uh, is that we would come away from today with the ability to articulate at least some of the ways in which 
The scripture and our Westminster standards uh, equip us to address issues of race and justice, both in the church and among our neighbors. And so let me start here with um, this first part, what I'm just calling beautiful community within the church. The focus for this section is going to be chapter 26 of the Westminster Confession of Faith of the Communion of Saints. And um, before we go there, um, I want to just explain what I mean by beautiful community. Uh, what I mean is that we were created by God as his image, particularly to image him as beautiful community, meaning God himself is beautiful community. What is that? That is the absolute perfection of unity and diversity, diversity and unity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God exists eternally in mutually glorifying, mutually honoring, mutually loving, mutually supportive, diverse community. And that is instructive for what it means literally to be human. Uh, to, um, to quote uh, from Herman Bovink on the image of God, when he said, the image of God is much too rich for it to be fully realized in a single human being, however richly gifted that human being may be. It can only be somewhat unfolded in its depths and riches in a humanity counting billions of members. Right? existing across time and space, both uh, uh, successively one after the other and contemporaneously side by side. He said, only humanity in its entirety as one complete organism summed up under a single head as prophet proclaiming the truth of God, as priest dedicating itself to God, as ruler controlling the earth and the whole creation. Only it is the fully finished image, the most telling and striking likeness of God. He said, you want to know what it means for humanity to be the image of God? Do you want to have that picture in your mind? You have to go to the end of the story. That every tongue, tribe, people, nation, before the throne, summed up or in, under a single head, saying, worthy is the lamb to receive power and glory and honor. He said, that's what you need to have in your mind. We were created. That's not God's plan B. We were created for that. Unity in diversity. And I... As I said, I've already kind of busted my time, so here's the deal. I'm going to run through just some of the aspects of the story <laughs> that I'm sure you're all familiar with, that we were, by divine design, created for a beautiful community. When God says, let us make man in our image uh, according to our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, uh, 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 and uh, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every th creeping thing that creeps along the earth, that when God declares this, uh, this uh, desire of his for humanity, he is declaring that we would image him literally in community, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And here's the challenge that we have, right? That was... God's declaration, um, but uh, I call the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 um, the, the creation of ghetto living, the ghettoization of humanity, the, divide, so the dividing of humanity such that as a consequence, <laughs> we see hostility, not just person to person, but people group to people group. That the story in Genesis 11, 1 is the whole earth, right, had the same language and spoke the same words. God had reissued the command in Genesis 9 after the flood, the recreation account to Noah and his family, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, right? And in Genesis 10 starts a new section, the generation of the sons of Noah, and, uh, and we get in Genesis 10, like the table of nations, the descendants of Noah's children and where they are over the face of the earth. And Genesis 11 starts to tell us how that happened, right? We all had one language, spoke the same words. God said, be fruitful and multiply. And the scripture says they, they migrated east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. 
And here's what we said to each other, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower, which is height extending to the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed from here over the face of the whole earth. God has said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Humanity's response was, no, thank you. We want to be God. And so God comes down in judgment and in mercy, confuses our language. So we stop <laughs> building the city and the tower because we can no longer understand each other. And it says two times, right? Genesis 11, 8 and 9. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the whole earth. <laughs> God did the dispersing. But now, as a consequence of this judgment, we have um, a disordered sense of humanity. And what I mean is, now I get my sense of who I am primarily from the group to which I belong. <laughs> It shapes and forms me, and when we encounter difference, we don't naturally uh, gravitate and, 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 and say, whoa, well, let me appreciate what facets and aspects of what it means to be the image of God is seen in this different culture or group or ethnicity, right? We begin to judge. We begin to say, y'all are different, right? Um, and we, we like the way we do things. And so here's the thing, right? What we need to get is um, this pattern that we see in Genesis. Every time God comes, the Lord comes and judges humanity because of sin, he follows up it up with a covenant promise to undo the effects of the judgment. And so what do we have after Babel in Genesis 11? The call of Abram, who is in Ur of the Chaldeans. God calls, to, the Lord calls Abram and says, get up, leave your, your kindred and your father's house and your people and go to the land I'm going to show you. And he begins to make this covenant promise to Abram, right? Um, I'm going to bless you, right? In, uh, in you, uh, he says, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. We, we should grasp, right, that this is God's promise to undo the effects of the judgment of our disunity and our division that happened in Babel. In you, all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed. This is a God's promise for reunion, for renewal, for reconciliation of humanity under the seed of Abraham or through the seed of Abraham. And we know who that is, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that begs a question then, I think, um, how then shall we live? As those who have been brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who have come into union with Christ by faith, how then shall we live? And there's many ways to answer that, but I want to focus particularly on a passage of Scripture in Colossians uh, chapter 3. And um, I'm not going to read all 17 verses here of Colossians 3, but right, this is the Apostle Paul and Paul's normal pattern right, in writing his letters is to lay out uh, the truth of the gospel, the indicatives, what, what is true, right? And then to follow that with the imperatives. What do we do based on what is true? Chapter 3 is where he's making this transition from the indicative to the imperative. And he says, right, if then or since then you have been raised with Christ, uh, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above 
not on things that are on earth, because you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also shall appear with him in glory. The apostle has said, listen, he said in chapter 2 that, that Jesus Christ has, has canceled the record of debt that stood against us by, by nailing it to the cross. Right? And because now, right, We've died with him. We've been raised with Christ. There is a particular way to live. And I want to note here that the apostle is talking to a diverse church in Colossae. How do we know that? Because he says in verse 11, here, Colossians, in the church, there isn't Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. He could say that because those were the people in the church. And so he's talking to these people. And so no, the you, since then you've been raised with Christ. I'm not, I'm from New York. I'm not New York City. I need to clarify that. Not New York State, New York City. Um, even though I do have roots in the South, in North Carolina. Um, but uh, the point is that it's y'all. Since y'all have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand. Because y'all have died and y'all's life is hidden with Christ in God. He's talking to the community. Right? This, is, this is your status. What does it look like to live as those who seek the things that are above where Christ is? We don't have to guess because he continues. After this glorious, you know, when Christ, who's your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. He says in verse 5, this is what it looks like. Put to death, therefore, what's earthly in you. The things that are earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which are idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you all too once walked. You lived in these things um, when, you were, uh, when you were living in them, but now you have to put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then he says here, there isn't Greek and Jew, right? Christ is all and in all. He, here's what it looks like, right? This seeking the things that are above, this, this heavenly-minded living, if you will. It looks like putting off and putting on, putting to death the things that are earthly, the things that are markers of our polarization and our division amongst each other. Amen. These things, put them away. Put them to death. <laughs> that means there's an activeness, right? Dang it. All right. I'm going off script again, but here we go. <laughs> um, the, the, the amazing thing, he speaks in those first four verses about what is already a reality. You, you're seated with him in the heavenly places. It's true. It's already true. Now, because of that, how do you live like it? Right? You, you don't live in a daydreamy, heavenly-minded world like the people used to say, you know, those who are, so, are heavenly-minded are no earthly good. No, no, no. Those who are heavenly-minded truly are the most earthly good because we recognize there's a living this putting to death what's earthly in you. And then he says, here you go, put on then. And I love this because, right, I just talked about indicative and imperative. 
Paul can't help himself. He keeps going back to, he keeps going back to whenever he can, he, he drops in the indicative. <laughs> Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and loved. And what he is doing is drawing right from Deuteronomy 7, where the Lord says to the people of Israel, it's not because you were the greatest of the peoples that the Lord chose you and set his love on you. Right? But you were the least of the peoples. And Paul is saying this identity, reality, that was so formative for ethnic Israel in its history now belongs to the church now belongs to all who know Jesus Christ regardless of ethnicity or background. This is your formative reality, God's chosen ones, holy and loved. So put on, what is this putting on? Right. Compassionate hearts, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. Right. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these things, above all of these things, he says, put on love. Put on love, which is, in my translating of the passage, the, the binding glue of perfection. Love is this binding glue in Christian community. This binding glue uh, 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 that, that exists among all of these differences. Right? Put on love, right? which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ Rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called, and be thankful. This trifecta of gratitude. Be thankful, be thankful, be thankful, right? To which indeed you are called, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ, Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. In all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in your hearts with thankfulness to God. Right? And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Be thankful, be thankful, be, be thankful for your life of love in this diverse community. Right. And so, let me transition here. Let me transition from what the scriptures have said, the story of scripture, and what we find here in Colossians 3, and we can go to a lot of other passages. We can, we can listen to our Lord Jesus, right? This is how uh, uh, the world will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another, right? We can, there are a lot of places we can go in the scriptures to, to make this point. But I think that when... The Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 26 begins to lay out the implications of our communion as the people of God is passages like that that they're leaning on. Three paragraphs. I'm going to read all three paragraphs. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 26. Paragraph one, all saints who are united to Jesus Christ, their head by his spirit and by faith, have fellowship with him in his graces, sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. And being united to one another in love, they participate in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to perform those public and private duties which lead to their mutual good both inwardly and outwardly. Every professing follower of Jesus Christ is united to him by faith and is thereby united to every other Christian in love. 
And this love carries some responsibilities. Again, leaning on what passages like what Paul says in Romans 13, 7, owe no one anything except love because love is the fulfilling of the law. Right. And what does it look like being united to one another in this kind of love? A participation in each other's gifts and graces. Right? Uh, and and a, an obligation to perform the things among each other that make for our mutual good, not just in some non-material, ethereal way, but inwardly and outwardly. And then, paragraph two. It is the duty of professing saints to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God and in the per performing such other spiritual services as help them to edify one another. It is their duty also to, to come to the aid of one another in material things according to their various abilities and necessities. And here it is, as God performs opportunity, or pro God affords opportunity rather, this communion is to be extended to all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. This, com this communion, this obligation of love, as God affords opportunity, is to be extended to all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, we'll deal with neighbors outside of the faith later. Let's just talk about our duty to one another. Let's talk for a minute just about the history of the church in the United States of America. Let's talk in particular about the history of Presbyterianism in the United States of America. As you all know, right, as much as there is to celebrate in that history, there's much to lament. We ask the question, like, when, when was it that Presbyterians did not say that the Westminster Confession of Faith, together with its larger and shorter catechisms, is a faithful representation of the system of doctrine taught in Scripture. When did we not say that? And the question is, no, never. We always say it. How many people do you think in, uh, in their ordination exams took exception to this part of the Westminster Confession? How many of you think said, uh, I take exception to the last sentence in paragraph two of chapter 26 of the Westminster Confession of Faith? I guarantee you nobody, right? Nobody. I'm, you know, I'm not the Lord, but I suppose. How is it then that we have on record uh, uh, esteemed Presbyterian theologians who argued for the segregation, division of the races, who argued for slavery, who argued for dehumanizing of black people in the United States. How is it possible if they said this is what the scriptures teach? How is it that they supported Laws that said, well, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean that you should be freed from slavery. It's because we refused to live out the implications of what we said we believed. We were more captivated by cultural commitments than we were to the word of God and our standards. Paragraph three, this communion which the saints have with Christ does not make them in any wise partakers of the substance of his Godhead or to be equal with Christ in any respect, either of which affirm it, um, 
either of which to affirm is impious and blasphemous, nor does their communion with one another as saints take away or infringe the title or propriety with each, which each man has in his goods and possessions, right? So again, we're called to a mutual love, but that doesn't mean I get to claim all your stuff, <laughs> right? And here's the thing. I said that um, we were created by God to image him as beautiful community, unity and diversity, diversity in unity, right? This unity, right, which is a, a that, which is bound up in love is a reflection of the unity of the Godhead, which is bound up in love. But the, the, the confession here is not basing um, what, what they're writing. The divines are not writing this from the vantage point of the, uh, the communion of saints being grounded in humanity imaging God. They're more explicitly uh, 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 grounding it in our union with Christ. That's what they say, right? right? All uh, saints who are united to Christ, right? Uh, we're thereby united to one another. But I think that um, it is still very obvious and clear. In his book on the Westminster Assembly, Robert Lethem writes this of this chapter of the, uh, of the confession, the com this communion is an overflow of the doctrine of the Trinity. There is union and unity, but in diversity. Our, our communion that the confession is talking about is an overflow of the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. There is communion, there's union and unity, but in diversity. Let me, let me share with you a few, um, a few quotes from commentators on this chapter of the confession. Robert Lethem, again, says the communion that the saints enjoy with each other does not erode or destroy the integrity of the individual. Again, this is an outflow of the doctrine of the Trinity. There's union, there's unity and union, but in diversity. Dr. Chad Van Dixorn, the picture of whose book is here on the screen, his book, Confessing the Faith, he writes in his book, ultimately, this love for each other cannot be restricted to what we have. It needs to encompass who we are. This love that we're being called to needs to encompass who we are. I had the opportunity when I was doing my research on this part of the confession several years ago uh, to, to utilize Dr. Van Dixhorn's library. He was still here in D.C. at the time, and if you know, he's an expert in uh, the Westminster Assembly. He's got, you know, books that, you know, you got to put on pillows and use gloves and stuff like that. But I had the opportunity to read some of the Westminster divines in, in, their, in their commenting on what <laughs> is written here in this chapter, and William Perkins one of the divines writes this. He says, we must here be admonished not to seek our own things, but to refer the labors of our callings to the common good. Lastly, considering we are all knit into one mystical body, our duty, listen, our duty is to redress the faults of our brethren and to cover them. Love covers a multitude of sins. Of course, he's quoting scripture here, but he says this is, he's letting us know this is what the divines are thinking as they're writing this chapter. What, when we think about the current conversation within the church around issues of race and justice and all of the heat that there is, right? How many of us are thinking 
even if I'm right and I believe my brothers and sisters are wrong, I have a duty to redress the faults of my brothers and sisters because love covers a multitude of sins. How many of us right, think uh, that as a first thought <laughs> in these issues? A generation ago, uh, George Hendry, oh, sorry, went a little too fast. Um, a theologian at Princeton Seminary. So you can imagine, you know, there are a lot of things you might not agree with him on that he writes from a generation ago, but I got this from Dr. Van Dixorn as well, and he said, yeah, just don't, just give that qualifier that we don't. <laughs> but this is money, what he says about what the confession says in this ch chapter. He says, this love is not one that's based on mutual attraction. This love that we're being called to is not one that's based on mutual attraction, but it is a love that overcomes divisions and reconciles contraries, bringing into communion those who have nothing in common save the fact that Christ gave himself for them. One of the things that Herman Bovink writes in talking about the image of God talking about God in the Trinity, the Trinity says, right, um, the, in God there is unity, and in God too there's unity and diversity, diversity and unity. He says, indeed, this order and this harmony of unity and diversity is present in him absolutely. And he says, but among creatures we only see a faint analogy of it. He says, among us, Unity exists only by attraction, by the will and the disposition of the will, Bavink says. It is a moral unity that's fragile and unstable. He says, when you look at particularly humanity, the most of the unity you see is based around attraction. Right? And the counterpoint here is what Hendry is saying about what the confession is calling us to is that the love that we're called to express is the saints is not one that's based on mutual attraction. It is one that literally overcomes divisions. It is one that literally reconciles contraries and brings into communion people who might not have anything in common except the fact that Christ gave himself for them. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm only a couple minutes over my time. That's not too bad. <laughs> we're going to stop here. We're going to take uh, 20 minutes for some table discussion. Uh, we got our table discussion uh, facilitators and leaders. And here are the questions that we're going to uh, to, uh, to consider at our tables. One, what tensions and polarizations have you seen and or experienced in the church around the issues of race and justice? Two, what does Westminster Confession chapter 26 imply about how we should engage one another in the church over these controversial issues? And question three is, what changes might God be calling you to make in the way that you engage other siblings in Christ around these issues? Right. So we're going to take 20 minutes for that conversation, and then we're going to come back together and have a 10 minutes of just kind of sharing and debrief. All right? And so I want to shift now for the rest of the time to what I'm calling beautiful community among our neighbors with a dive into the Westminster Larger Catechism, just particularly uh, some aspects of uh, the Larger Catechism. And I, I recognize we're, you know, we're talking about justice, but Right? I haven't tried to define justice at all, <laughs> right? And so I find it, I'm, it's interesting to see, well, 
in the Westminster Standards, how do the Westminster Standards talk about justice? Right. What do we find? And we find in, you know, and I'm not going to read um, all of these, but overwhelmingly in the Westminster Standards, the reference to justice is about God's justice. That is most of what we will find. There's only a few samples here. Chapter 3 of God's eternal decree, right? The rest of mankind, God extends or withholds mercy as he pleases to the praise of his glorious justice. Of providence, chapter 5, God, the great creator of all things, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things to the praise of, his, uh, praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. i to read at least a justification, chapter 11, Christ by his obedience and death did fully discharge the debt of all those that are thus justified and did make a proper and real full satisfaction to his father's justice in their behalf. Yet inasmuch as he was given by the father for them and his obedience and satisfaction accepted in their stead and both freely not for anything in them their justification is only a free grace that both the exact justice and rich grace of god might be glorified in the justification of sinners the justice of god <laughs> right. primarily that's what we're going to find in the standards when we look for justice. However, we will find, we might call this, uh, and this is not necessarily uh, a hard and fast division, but a vertical justice and a horizontal justice, right? As it relates to God's divine justice, as it relates to justice among humanity. When it gets to what we might call horizontal justice, in the standards, that is primary, primarily found, those references are primarily found in the larger catechism question and answers in the second table of the law, right? um, which right, is about our duties to our neighbors, neighbor love. Right? That's where the bulk of references to justice among each other is found. Right? Uh, we'll get into these a little bit later, but just as an example, what are the sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment? Question 36, the sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment are all taking away the life of ourselves and of others, except in the case of public justice. What are the duties required in the Eighth Commandment? The duties required in the Eighth Commandment are truth, faithfulness, and justice in contracts and commerce between man and man. What are the sins forbidden in the Eighth Commandment? The sins forbidden are, just, are injustice, rather, and unfaithfulness in contracts between man and man. In our dealings with each other, right? The catechism, the standards are going to engage the question of justice horizontally, right? How we deal with one another. And I want to say, well, what is justice? Um, justice is not an abstract concept uh, that's divorced from action. So even, right, the justice or the righteousness of God is not simply about his personal righteousness, right? Rather, it is also that God is just in all of his ways, that the Lord of all the earth will always do what is just, right? Uh, because, as the scriptures tell us in places like Psalm 89, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. He works righteousness and justice for the oppressed. And God, right, yes, uh, in himself is just. 
right? And his, all of his ways, therefore, then, are just. You might say, according to uh, one Bible dictionary, at least, that the justice of God can be understood as that perfection of his na nature, whereby he is infinitely righteous in himself and in all that he does. Right, the righteousness of the divine nature exercised in his moral government. So it is a both and, right? Uh, Werner Harrison, in her book, God's Many Splendored Image, says this. She says, when Christians look at the human experience from God's perspective, the differences between men and women or owners and slaves look small compared to the issues all people face, such as divine judgment and salvation. That is not to say, right, that the issues between people in our divisions and hostilities and injustices and inhumanities like slavery, like um, uh, 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 oppression, like uh, injustices among uh, the, 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 the genders, right, doesn't matter. It matters, yes, a lot. But as her point is, compared to the divine justice of God, right, in that vertical re relationship, right, all of these are relatively small in comparison, right? Because God is just, right? And we are not. Therein lies the, the primary reality of our problem in the human experience. And so um, I, I, uh, earlier this year, the Gospel Coalition did a, um, a podcast episode with, um, with Tim Keller on race and justice in the church. And he was helpful, as Tim Keller often is, um, in, in defining justice. He says, you know, we might say that doing justice is simply giving people what, they're, what is their due as image bearers of God. All right. So doing Living justly, then, from a biblical perspective, we will survey the scriptures. He, he puts it in these four categories. It includes equal and fair treatment. It includes generosity. It includes special advocacy for the poor and both individual and corporate responsibility. And so justice, I would say, is for, justice has an end, it's for the purpose of pursuing shalom, wholeness, harmony, right relationship, things being as they ought to be between God and humanity and among humanity. And so I wanna borrow in, uh, before we get to um, the first catechism questions I want to look at, um, borrow this, um, this, this four pain uh, image from Dr. Carl Ellis when he uses the phrase comprehensive kingdom righteousness. That, um, that when we think about, you know, uh, one, of, um, one of the things that really had an impact on me in seminary is when I heard this quote from Gerhardus Voss. I read it at least, in his description of the kingdom of God from Jesus' perspective. And he's, as he surveys the gospels, and he says, you know, the, the kingdom for Jesus, the kingdom exists not merely where God is supreme, because that is always and everywhere true, but it exists where, where, where he carries through that supremacy against the forces that oppose it and brings people to the willing recognition of the same. That for Jesus, the kingdom exists where God carries through his supremacy against the forces that oppose it and brings people to the willing recognition of it. And so there's a comprehensiveness to the kingdom of God. And it's codified in these four ways, I think helpfully by Dr. Ellis. He says, you know, there's personal godliness, 
right? So you got godliness and justice and personal and social. There's personal godliness, right? Which is essentially, right, a personal piety, live right, right? There's personal justice, which is at an individual level, uh, do right. <laughs> do right to your neighbor, right? Be just in your dealings with your neighbors. Live right, do right to neighbors. And he said very often in evangelicalism, we are uh, overweighted on the personal side, particularly in the personal godliness side and maybe in the personal justice side. But he says there's also corporate godliness, right? A corporate to, right, uh, as the people of God, a living right as the people of God and a corporate doing right, a social or a corporate justice. This, and, and, and one of the reasons why we need each other in the body of Christ is because very often we are, we are weighted or imbalanced one way or the other based on actual cultural and social circumstances. And we're very often blind to see the other aspects of it. And so here's what I want to do. Let me check my time. I think, okay, I'm good. Um, a lot of text here. You know, those Westminster divines wrote a, <laughs> wrote a lot. <laughs> very verbose. But to our benefit, all right? Um, the, I want to focus here on first these um, first questions uh, in the larger catechism about the moral law. Uh, and I'll tell you the point I'm making after I read them. What is the moral law? Question number 92. Moral law is the declaration of the will of God to mankind, direction, direction and binding everyone to personal, perfect, and perpetual conformity and obedience thereunto in the frame and disposition of the whole man's soul and body, and in performance of all those duties of holiness and righteousness which he oweth to God and man, promising life upon the fulfilling and threatening death upon the breach of it. Of what use is the moral law to all men? The moral law is of use to all men to inform them of the holy nature and will of God and of their duty binding them to walk accordingly, to convince them of their disability to keep it, and of the sinful pollution of their nature, hearts, and lives, to humble them in the sense of their sin and misery, and thereby help them to a clearer sight of the need they have of Christ and of the perfection of his obedience. Question number 90, 98, rather. Where is the moral law summarily comprehended. The moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments, which were delivered by the voice of God upon Mount Sinai and written by him in two tablets, tables of stone, and are recorded in the 20th chapter of Exodus. The first four commandments containing our duty to God and the other six our duty to man. Here's the point here in reading all of this, right? This is what the catechism is saying, right? Essentially, the moral law of God, right, binds everybody, believer and unbeliever alike, for all time. So, if we want to ask, what does it look like to engage our, our duties as the people of God to, our, to those outside of the church, to our neighbors, this is the place to go. Of course, the scriptures too, yes, right? But in terms of the way it's elucidated, look at the second table of the law in the Westminster Larger Catechism. And that, 
that uh, the, the phrasing, right, of, our, of the questions where the catechism rightly says where a, um, where a sin is forbidden, the opposite duty is required, and vice versa, right, where a duty is required, the opposite sin is forbidden. And this binds all of humanity, right? Uh, the, the, the catechism will use the language in, um, in one of the, maybe more than one, of the, uh, the questions and answers um, that, that this, is, this is, is a requirement in the family, the church, and the commonwealth. <laughs> Everything. Right? In civic society, in the, the ecclesia, and in the family. Right? And so one of the questions we need to ask, and we'll get to ask this question <laughs> later at our tables, is when those outside of the body of Christ are in violation of the moral law of God, what is the church's responsibility in engaging that? Because they are duty bound to the moral law of God. But the likelihood is they don't really care a whole heck of a lot. Because they're not reading the Westminster Larger Catechism or the scriptures. So as we pursue righteousness and holiness, in the public square, what is the responsibility of the followers of Jesus Christ when those outside of the body of Christ are violating the moral law of God? All right? That's a question. I'm just putting it out there. We'll get to engage it in a little later. So I, wanted, um, I want to start here uh, on the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment. Right, honor thy father and mother, that their days, thy days may be long upon the land that the Lord thy God is giving you. Um, the point right here in bringing up these questions, these preliminary questions, what right, what are who are meant by father and mother, and why are superior styled father and mother is that the, that that when the commandment says honor thy father and mother, that well, the reference there is not just to our biological parents or grandparents, but it is a reference to all those who are in legitimate authority. And here it is at the end of uh, answer 124, right? Who are over us in place of authority, whether in the family, church, or commonwealth, right? That this commandment refers to all legitimate authority, right? In the family, in the church, and in the commonwealth, right? And so, here are more questions and answers. What is the general scope of the fifth commandment? The answer is, the general scope of the fifth commandment is the performance of those duties which we mutually owe in our several relations as superiors or inferiors, superiors, or equals, right? And of course, this language that the, we might in the 21st century use different words than superiors and inferiors, the catechism is not talking about ontological superiority or inferiority, it's talking about in our relationships, Right, um, uh, our boss, <laughs> right, or a subordinate, right, at work. It's in that kind of uh, um, relationship that that is meant in that language. Um, here's what I want to. Uh, all right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna go to questions 129 and 130, right? Um, the honor that inferiors owe their superiors, the sins of inferiors against their superiors. I want to go here first. What, are the, what is required of superiors towards their inferiors? It is required of superiors according to that power they receive from God, right? That power they receive from God in the family, in the church, in the commonwealth, and that relation wherein they stand to love, 
pray for and bless their inferiors, to instruct, counsel, and admonish them, countenancing, commending, and rewarding such as do well, and discountenancing, reproving, and chastising such as do ill, protecting and providing for them in all things necessary for soul and body, and by grave, wise, holy, and exemplary carriage to procure glory to God, honor to themselves, and so to preserve that authority which God has put upon them. What are the sins of superiors? The sins of superiors are, besides, you know, you gotta love this, right? Besides the neglect of the duties, right? Besides neglecting everything we just said, are uh, inordinate, inordinate seeking of themselves their own glory, ease, profit, or pleasure, commanding things unlawful or not in the power of inferiors to perform, counseling, encouraging, or favoring them in that which is evil, dissuading, discouraging, or discountenancing them in that which is good, correcting them unduly, uh, careless, exposing, or leaving them, leaving them to wrong, temptation, and danger, provoking them to wrath, or any way dishonoring themselves or lessening their authority by unjust, indiscreet, rigorous, or remiss behavior. That's a mouthful. So here's what we're about to do. And I think we got printouts of this on the tables for you because Here's a discussion question. We're doing this for just 10 minutes. Here's the question. Given the explication of the catechism on the requirements and sins of superiors, how should the church respond when those in civil authority are not living up to those requirements, i.e., our political leaders, law enforcement, and the like? Right? What, what, what should the church do in response when those in legitimate civil authority are not living up to those requirements? This is an open question, right? It is um, a question that we don't normally consider based on what the catechism says, but the catechism is right. This is the requirement of those in civil authority. So I'm going to set our clock timer again for 10 minutes. Are we clear on the question? What I want to do is um, continue with this look at uh, um, engaging our neighbors, um, uh, out of an understanding of what we find in the larger catechism's explication of certain aspects of the second table of the law, 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 um, by looking at two more commandments and then a, um, an example out of uh, Presbyterian history. And then we'll do our third group discussion and then kind of wrap it up in conversation with each other around all of what was presented today. So I'm going to read here the Sixth Commandment, um, the duties required and the sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment. Right? What is the Sixth Commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Right. What are the duties required in the Sixth Commandment? A lot. <laughs> the duties required in the Sixth Commandment are all careful studies and lawful endeavors to preserve the life of ourselves and others by resisting all thoughts and purposes, subduing all passions and avoiding all occasions, temptations, and practices which tend to the unjust taking away of the life of any by just defense thereof against violence, patient bearing of the hand of God, quietness of mind, cheerfulness of spirit, 
a sober use of meat and drink, uh, physic and sleep, labor and recreation, by charitable thoughts, love, compassion, meekness, gentleness, kindness, peaceable, mild, and courteous speeches and behavior, forbearance, readiness to be reconciled, patient bearing and forgiving of injuries, and requiting good for evil, comforting and succoring the distressed, and protecting and defending the innocent. What are the sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment? The sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment are all taking away of the life of ourselves or of others except in case of public justice, lawful war, or necessary defense, the neglecting or withdrawing the lawful and necessary means of preservation of life, sinful anger, hatred, envy, desire of revenge, all excessive passions, distracting cares, immoderate use of meat, drink, labor and recreations, provoking words, oppression, quarreling, striking, wounding, and whatsoever else tends to the destruction of the life of any. There's one particularly you know, striking line here, always when I read this, is that sin forbidding the neglecting or withdrawing the lawful and necessary means of preservation of life. Um, I mean, this has all kinds of implications for the public square. Um, I'm going to read now, even longer, <laughs> The ninth commandment. The ninth commandment, thou shalt, I mean, we could do this literally with all of the second table of the law, right? All right we, we are limited in our time, right? Um, but we could, we could just as well be able to talk about the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal, right? Uh, and the duties required and the sins forbidden there as it relates to our lives among our neighbors. Uh, even outside of the church. Ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The duties required in the commandment are, when we read the highlighted portions, the preserving and promoting of truth between man and man, and the good name of our neighbor as well as our own. The preserving and promoting of truth among one another, and the preserving and promoting of the good name of our neighbor and our own good name. A charitable esteem of our neighbors, loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good name, sorrowing for and covering of their infirmities is required in this ninth commandment. I'm going to just read what I've highlighted here in red. Sins forbidden in the ninth commandment are all prejudicing the truth and the good name of our neighbor as well as our own. Sins forbidden are concealing the truth, undue silence in a just cause, and holding our peace when iniquity calls for either a reproof from ourselves or complaint to others, right? Slandering, backbiting, tailbearing, whispering, misconstruing intentions, words and actions, receiving and countenancing evil reports, scornful contempt, neglecting such things as are of good report. You can go on and on, but we think about how are we engaging these issues of race and justice inside and outside of the church? How often are we finding 
literally, I mean, reading these things, we can say we are finding, we can probably clearly speak of examples of violating the ninth commandment, even ourselves, right? right? Not just pointing at others, right? But the kinds of things it says here, right? Undo silence in a just cause, right? As a violation of the ninth commandment, right? Holding our peace when iniquity calls for a reproof, right? It's a violation of the commandment, right? Prejudicing the good name of our neighbors, misconstruing intentions, right? How regularly we, do we find this in our public discourse? And so here's what I want to do. I want to kind of just give an example in Presbyterian history, and there are a few of these I could go to, um, but one of my favorites is Reverend uh, Matthew Anderson. I want to, an example of uh, comprehensive kingdom righteousness um, uh, in uh, Presbyterian history. Um, Reverend Matthew Anderson, and if you've heard me talk before, you've heard me talk about him very likely. Uh, he lived from 1847 to 1928. He was born in Pennsylvania as a fifth generation Presbyterian. He was trained at Oberlin College, Princeton Seminary, and Yale. Um, you know, now, you know, imagine what it was like to be in those spaces in the late 1800s um, as a black man. He came to Philadelphia in 1879 and stayed there for his entire ministry. He started Berean Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia and a range of other ministries out of the church. A penny savings bank, a building and loan association, a manual training school, job training, a medical dispensary, a kindergarten, these things that he called the Berean Enterprises, right? Building a congregation, encouraging home ownership, developing a school. And um, he took charge, when he came to Philadelphia, he took charge of what was known as the Gloucester Mission, started by the Gloucesters, another black Presbyterian family. Uh, this is 1879, and he was wrestling over the decision of whether or not to plant a Presbyterian church for the colored people in the city of Philadelphia. The year before he arrived in Philadelphia, he had a, uh, a pressing invitation from the American Missionary Association to lecture in England and Europe on their behalf, along with the Fisk Jubilee Singers. So, right, he got this opportunity to go overseas. This is 1879, right? I got my education. I've been to divinity school. I have the opportunity to get funded and go overseas, leave the United States of America, and do the preaching circuit in England and Europe with the Fisk Jubilee Singers. But he wrote, he said, but we refused, choosing rather to labor humbly but independently at home than conspicuously and servilely abroad. And I, you know, this is from Reverend Anderson. So he, he, his book, Presbyterianism, its relation to the Negro is where most of this uh, information comes from. He says this, he said, as we thought of these opportunities which we let slip, these opportunities to go to Europe, right, and looked at the little dingy place of meeting in the second story back room in Milton Hall in Philadelphia and the little poor and almost childish audience, we asked ourselves over and over again, were we not silly for coming to Philadelphia to take charge of a mission which could present no better outlook than this. 
He continues, is this the church which had been pictured in our imagination when preparing for the ministry? When I'm going through these seminary classes, thinking about pastoring, and I got the church that I'm going to pastor in my mind, is it this? Right? Is this the vast audience which we were to address? And are these the intelligent, industrious, and enterprising people which we had seen in imagination? Have we not been exceedingly silly to let so many golden opportunities slip of the fields which were commensurate with our ambition and ability for, the, for this poor sterile field, the Gloucester Mission? Right? Given all of my credentials, all of my capability, were we not exceedingly silly to let all those opportunities slip to come here. Right. And he says, he writes, uh, drawing some conclusions along the way as to the hindrances and opportunities in planting the church. And the two things that he writes about that I want to highlight two apathies that he says he had to overcome in planting Berean Presbyterian Church. He says, first, he has to overcome the apathy of the presbytery. He said he had to arouse them to the importance of the work. He said mission work had so long been neglected among the colored people that the presbyteries had almost forgot, had lost sight of them, and they were very ignorant as to their real wants, read real needs, and condition. At the presbytery within which Philadelphia resided had, had no active thought to ministering to the needs of the black people within their bounds. See, I had to, we had to arouse them to the importance of this work. And then he says, we had to deal with the apathy of the colored people. He said, he said, in saying that we saw a demand for the establishment of a Presbyterian church among the colored people, we do not for a moment mean to imply that they were anxious and eager to have a church planted among them and were standing ready to do all in their power to sustain it, not by any means. There was a demand for a church, but it was demanded by the condition and needs of the colored people. They themselves, he writes, were for the most part indifferent, not so much toward the establishment of this particular church, but towards the Presbyterian church generally. And this pre prejudice was inherited, being associated in their minds with the church which encouraged slavery, also as being cold, aristocratic, pharisaical, and which had no use for the Negro more than to use him as a servant. This spirit, he said, would have to be overcome before there would be any marked success. Here's why I bring him up in the context of this conversation. Because clearly he stayed and planted and pastored Berean Presbyterian Church. He, he is a part of the same tradition to which we belong conforming to the same confessional, doctrinal standards which we adhere to. And out of that center, he says, and not by himself, because he uses the term, the word we. <laughs> it's not, he couldn't have done it all, right? But what were the needs um, and conditions of the people, right? So he recognized, so they start a penny savings and loan, right? Because he recognizes, oh, that home ownership is a path to being on solid financial uh, setting here in this country. And banks don't lend to black people. So we're going to, we're going to start a savings and loan. 
We're also going to make sure that we can uh, create opportunities for people to get job training. <laughs> We're going to have a, a manual training school. And here's part of the issue is the educational opportunities for, quote unquote, as he would say, the colored people. So we're starting early. We're starting a kindergarten. Oh, and, well, black people here in the city don't really have access to good medical care. So we're starting a medical dispensary, too. This is not this mercy ministry. You think about the, the community to which he was engaging. Yes, he says they were poor, right? They certainly were. But this is justice work. If we remember justice being def uh, defined or understood as giving people what is their due as image bearers of God. So this is not simply about, oh, well, because we are all sinners, <laughs> right? And under God's wrath, we deserve judgment from God. No, this is what, is we, what our image bearers do. Opportunity for life and flourishing. What does the church care about? Seeing image bearers flourish. Yes, come to know Christ. But he, what he's engaging here is a comprehensive kingdom pursuit the whole person and community. I'm gonna stop here, but I, I would say we could also talk about another pillar, Francis Grimke, who is a contemporary of Matthew Anderson, who pastored a 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. for 50 years. Uh, you know, a stalwart, you, will not a, you won't find a man more committed to the authority of scripture, the preaching of the gospel um, of Christ, and the promotion of social action for the benefit of people. He was a part of the Niagara movement, which uh, led to the, the development of the NAACP, right? Um, he, he was co-belligerent with People like W.E.B. Du Bois, right, um, as a minister of the gospel, right, because of this understanding of what is good and right and true, even in the public square. Right? Okay, I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to pose the last set of questions. Sorry, you're going to only get another 10 minutes for these so that we can have a kind of a group wrap up in conversation here at the end. So yes, we got Reverend Matthew Anderson in mind here, but I wanna go back and yeah, I can go back and put any of those screens up if you'd like um, from the catechism. But here are the last two questions. The catechism says, this is right from commandment six, that we are obligated to preserve our lives and the lives of others, as well as the forbidding of taking away the lives of ourselves and others. In what ways should the church actively engage the issues related to promoting life for our neighbors from the womb to the tomb? What does it look like for the church to actually be robustly pro-life? Right. Second, much of our conversation, particularly online and in social media contexts around the issues of race and justice, are ungracious at best. I think that's a little generous. What witness does the Ninth Commandment require of us in all of our interactions among those with whom we disagree? Those are our two questions. We got 10 minutes, um, and I'm going to put the clock up. So table leaders, take it away. I, I'm really grateful for your time today and, and the opportunity to have this conversation with you. Um, my, again, my, my hope is that, that you... Um, been um, invigorated, reinvigorated, 
um, to, to really engage our standards on these hard issues as a, a guidepost to how to talk about them within the context of our churches, not to say we dismiss you know, Scott had said, you know, we've, we know that they're, they're sociological, um, a sociological approaches here, and I'm not down on, my son's a sociologist, I'm not down on sociology. Um, um, but we want to, because again, all truth is God's truth, but we want to say, well, primarily, we, let's, let's start with our primary resources, God's word, our doctrinal standards, right? Um, as a guide into these necessary conversations um, that, um, that the church should have, all right? Thank you again for your time. You wanna say a closing word uh, for us, Scott? And First of all, I wanna have us all thank you. Uh, uh, our hope in, in pulling this off here together, pulling this together, is that I know for so many of us, the last several months, it's been a difficult conversation, conversations to have. Uh, the people are so divided on these uh, issues that we sometimes just want to back away from that. And then we wind up being silent. And silence is actually speaking. It's saying something. And so I hope that, you know, from today that we're encouraged from Scripture, uh, from our Reformed tradition, that just as Earl was talking about, we really do have robust tools to be able to lean into it not be silent on a just cause, uh, but to be able to lean into and speak into these very, very important issues. And just to kind of circle back, if I could, to, to where Erwin began, uh, reminding us of our eternal and inevitable future that is laid out there in Revelation 7 and 9. People from every tribe and tongue and nation, people who, because God cannot be imaged in any one person or any one church or even one denomination like the PCA. And I know it is all of our hope that the PCA stands for a preview of coming attractions. That the world will be able to look at the PCA and to be able to say, this is what heaven looks like and it is really good. And so I hope that just from what we've done today, that it'll just kind of move out uh, all forward a little bit and uh, just be a little bit more uh, pointed in the right direction. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you everybody.